And today, uh, uh, my topic of the talk is on the indigenous subjectivity law and its formations. And the idea I mentioned a little bit from my yesterday's talk. And before I start my presentation, I would like to uh, say that this is an ongoing project uh, because this is going to be contribute to the book possibly uh, will be published by the source here. So this is truly an ongoing project, so it's not a finished uh, version yet. So this is I would like to clarify in the beginning. And the rest of myself, I think I already uh, introduced myself to you yesterday. I'll start my, uh, my talk on these issues. And the reason I started, I, the reason I started this topic, uh, of course, there is some uh, legislative backgrounds. Like I said yesterday, uh, the legislature in Taiwan uh, enacted actually uh, made amendment to the best law to add uh, Article Two One, saying that the tribal community could be recognized as the public juristic persons. So that is the legislative background. But there are some other social issues which brought, which brings my attention to this uh, topic. Um, you, you, you might, if you uh, notice the uh, thing, uh, news in Taiwan, you might also uh, uh, notice the, the, this, this one here. So let's give a just just short clip.所以说希望双方能够对此事后做个说明，主要做修道，非常好。是呃，学校这边特别在准备一个解剖，希望能够接受。因为它不是台大出材鉴定人故意刁难市原住民婚礼的固定程序，台大办婚礼部落还有近百
the the topic is on the a giant wooden totem housing the ancestral spirit of indigenous community has been formally rehoused at the National Taiwan University through a traditional Kwaiwan wedding. And the totem first appeared on record in 1932 when it entered the collection of the Daihoku Imperial University. So that's the predecessor of the NTU. A member of its tribe did not regain access to the totem until 2015. So for all this past a long time, none of the members from the community can have access to this totem. Okay, so from the Minister of Culture, so they host, they support this Taiwan totem uh, wedding with the NTU. And you can see from this uh, the news thing that the relic received designation as a na national treasure earlier this year, which means 2015 in March, and members of its tribal community agreed to entrust care of the totem to NTU's Museum of Anthropology. They also requested the museum to hold a wedding ceremony that would welcome ancestral spirit Mokai as a bride. With the original totem now housed safely in the Taipei Museum, the Paiwan elders hopes to construct an identical pillar for their village in Pingdong in the hope of drawing more guy back to their community. So this, this is the official statement issued by the Ministry of Cultures, not the statement made by the tribal communities. Okay? But the thing is, I, I would like to compare another example, which is Amis Tapalang Katapian Totem Pole. And this actually has been filmed by a director, Professor Wu Tai also from National Taiwan University. And the topic is on the returning souls. It's, it's just kind of trailer and uh, very short.
awak satu cima ya mula enam tu umat tirai tu ko oleh indra mana boris tetapi kena ina. Because the Kakitaan is the traditional belief from the one of the tribal community, so they want to welcome, they want to take that pillar back to the community. So also you can see the shaman lay down on the floor, saying that the Kakitaan should be built on this land here, but the land has already been belongs to other private owners. So it becomes an issue, also a controversial issue inside the tribal community. And in the end, the court saying that it is it is a private land. So you have to find another place to put your traditional belief Dagitan. So two different cases re re represent what is the tribal communities. How can a village or tribal community can do about their public affairs. And this is kind of the, the transition of the tribe's locations in Taiwan. The left, uh, on your left, left hand side, is from the 1930s. And until the year 2000, so you can see the population, the density is spread out all over Taiwan. So it's not like the 1930s. So which also tells us my, uh, the Idea, the original idea of the tribal community may not just the, may not be the same as the 1930s. So how can we use a law to make or to justify a tribal community as a public juristic person? Or how can we use the law to make the tribal community be a juristic person? On what structures? So in 1997, just like I also explained to you yesterday, Taiwan's constitutional law was amended to demand the state should safeguard the status and political participation of the indigenous peoples. However, the details of the indigenous rights still need to be established by law and a number of different audiences. So which means if we want to develop an indigenous right through legal constructions. It needs three main strengths of the indigenous rights. We need to identify the subject and the contents of the rights and also the scope of the rights. And in 2015, the Taiwan's Indigenous People's Best Law has been modified and the Article 2-1 defined the Aboriginal tribes could be recognized as 
public juristic person, and this amendment would be taken as a progressive step for the recognition of the subject of the indigenous rights. So this article is the first legislative construction which gives us an idea that indigenous peoples could be a rights holder as a legal subject. So this brings me to the question, also I explain share to you, what is the definition of the public juristic persons? Both in common law and civil law countries, I think in Taiwan, maybe in other countries too, there is no regulatory definition of the public juristic persons. But academically, public juristic persons are those who are incorporated in accordance with public law and are recognized as having legal rights and obligations, such as having the ability to make administrative actions to sue and to be sued. Right? But right now, according to the ROC legal system, there were four different types public juristic persons. I missed one yesterday. The one I missed is the Irrigation Association. And actually right now Taiwan is under discussion whether or not to change the Ir Irrigation Association to become a private juristic person, not public juristic persons. So if you are interested, you can follow the discussions in Taiwan. So right now four different types. State, local self-governing bodies, irrigation association, and non-departmental public bodies. Those four types are the legal public juristic persons right now we have in Taiwan. But when we compare to the law, the content, saying that actually it says nothing. Okay, it says nothing about the content. Because if we look at Article 2-1, saying that in order to promote independent development of indigenous tribe at its will, the tribe should establish tribal council. And the tribe which ratified by the central authority in charge of indigenous affairs shall be considered as public juristic persons. So does it tell us what is public juristic person as indigenous tribe? Nothing. Right? So like I said yesterday, we might choose from four of these, but definitely we are we could we could not possibly be irrigation association because that's very specific type. But can we be the, the rest of three? That's open for discussion. So from the definition of, of the public juristic person, then come to the functions. Because every public juristic person has its rights and obligations, which means what kind of a functions it has. Although different public juristic persons have different purposes of establish, they all have certain legal obligations to achieve and have specific public power to perform their tasks. So a public juristic person has artificial personality, which we, we all, we will all agree, the so-called public juristic person is artificial, has artificial personality, and allows that entity to be considered under law separately from its individual members. So the function must show this public juristic person their legal obligations what kind of legal obligation they have to achieve through their authority, through their administrative power. Again, from this article, you cannot see anything. So if a tribe is ratified by the central authority in charge of indigenous affairs and considered as public juristic persons, then this tribal public juristic person shall carry out the indigenous public affairs in its own name by his organization, even by his own money. However, after the long colonial history, what public affairs left for the tribe and in which land? Where come from the income for the tribe? If we follow this module 
to understand what is public juristic process. Especially, I show you 1930s through to year 2000, the social organization structure in the tribal community has been destructured a lot. But other than that, although the Article 2-1 did, did not say anything about the function, about the content, but if we look at the rest of the indigenous people's basic law, we might still see something that could be the applications and administri administrative powers for the tribal communities. So let's see from Article 2 here. So what is tribe? The tribe refers to a group of indigenous persons who form a community by living together in specific areas of the indigenous people's regions and following the traditional norms with the approval of the central indigenous authority. This brings me to think we might start to think of tribal public juristic person should have this kind of characteristics, follow traditional norm. We have our own central indigenous authority, but the real content we can develop later. And Article 20 says that the government recognizes indigenous people's rights to land and natural resources. So this article is also open for discussion. If the government recognizes indigenous people's special indigenous people's rights to land and natural resources, which means we have land base. And this land base can also bring us what? Income, because we have natural resources. This can support a public juristic person to run on our own. And also Article 21, Paragraph 2, saying that the state, the, the state in a short version, show stipulate the regulation for delimiting the area of indigenous land. So, under Article 21, Paragraph 4, the state should delimit the indigenous land. So, which means, once the land has been delimited, then we might have a very identical or specific area. But, of the record, Article 21, is a very controversial article right now in Taiwan. If you notice the news, we have a protest. It's over one year and still carry on before the presidential office. So even we have this law existing, but still has some other complaints. Uh 因此那是七号傍晚再次召开巴尼会进行的部落会议自己的运动
那些智慧都是聚集在一起，那是更大的。传统领域画社喊了许多年，但工程浩大，所需的人力物力让许多部落迟迟未能实际展开。不过受到首波原住民族传统画社公告的影响，也让部落产生自觉，必须赶紧进行画社，才能维系祖先留下来的土地权益。也是新闻诺兰博仁爱，陈总。So another one here, and I'll explain later. The county, what's it? The mayor, so the magistrate, 县长 of the Nantou Xian. Okay, so these two cases. Sorry, thanks. Okay. Switch on. Yeah. Okay. So the laws, like I explained. We have the right to our land and natural resources, and the state should help us to delimit the area. But the controversy arises, both inside the indigenous peoples and also the outside with the non-indigenous peoples. So, which also brings me to think about how does the tribal community, as a public Jewish person, can do about it. And also, in the basic law, also says that indigenous people have the right to feel free, private, and informed consent. It's stated in Article 21, Paragraph 1. says that when governments or private parties engage in land development, resource utilization, ecology conservation, and academic research in indigenous land, tribe and their adjoined land which owned by governments. They shall consult and obtain consent by indigenous peoples or tribes, even their participation and share benefit with their indigenous peoples. So this is very the, the most general uh, article stating about indigenous right to free, private, and informed consent, and not only stated in this law, also, if we see the Spatial Planning Act, Article 11, Paragraph 2, this is the most important about zoning laws in Taiwan. In its Article 11, Paragraph 2, saying that, like, see the underline, if the specific area in the National Spatial Plan and uh, stated, uh, include the land or sea area that belongs to indigenous people, then what they have to do? They have to do with the Article 21 of the Indigenous Peoples Basket Law. So if the state wants to do zoning according to the, this national spatial plan and it's involved indigenous land, then you have to follow Article 21. Also in Coastal Zone Management Act, also has the same uh, the statement. Article 16, paragraph 2 says that where the coastal conservation plan involves restricting indigenous peoples from using their land, natural resources, and adjoined land, the agency should consult the local indigenous tribe and acquire its consent before the plan enters the deliberation processes. Also, in Article 21 of Basque Law says that if the scholar if the scholar want to do the research on indigenous land, you have to consult indigenous peoples. Human Subject Research Act, Article 15, says that where the research purposes involves indigenous people, then besides the requirements of, the, of Article 12 through 14, subpra, there shall additionally be required consultations to obtain the consent of their indigenous group 
any publication of research result should require the same consent. So having said all this, the first problem rises. You will see different usage has been used in different laws, right? So how could we identify who has the right to claim they have the right for the free parental consent? What is the subject here? How can we identify the subject? Because even different law, actually all these laws say the same thing. This thing is about right to free parental consent. But in best in basic law, it says indigenous peoples or tribes. In spatial planning act, it says nothing, just follow the best law. In coastal zone management act says that you have to consult the local indigenous tribe. So what's the difference between the local indigenous tribe and indigenous tribe? Human Subject Research Act says that you have to obtain the consent of their indigenous group. So is there any differences? Or how can we identify which refers to whom? Right? So this is the issue we are facing right now. Even the Article 2-1 says that the indigenous tribe could be considered as public juristic person. But this brings me to the question about what kind of rights of free crime from consent. It maybe we can say in the most broad way, it is a human right. But does the right, the right, I mean, how do I say? The right has a positive understanding and passive understanding, which means if the right is a positive and you can claim and you can even sue to make it happen. But the right, if a, it is a passive, and then it is only happen when the right has been harmed by others. So what kind of, uh, the nature of right, how, how can we identify what kind of rights of the free, free private consent should belong to? Is, is that is a positive or passive? Or even, it is just a legal interest shared by everyone. So, there are two different issues we have to deal with. The first is the subject. How can we identify a tribe? And the second question is, what kind of right which can be practiced by this the so-called tribe? So, Maybe we can define the right to free private consent as a public affairs. So those rights might be practices as a public juristic persons. But we have other legislations called Protection Act for the Traditional Intellectual Creation of Indigenous People, which I also mentioned very, very little yesterday. So in Article 3 it says that the intellectual creations referred to this act show mean traditional religious ceremonies, music, dance, songs, sculptures, weaving, patterns, clothing, folk crafts, or any other expression of the cultural achievement of indigenous peoples. So the issues here related to my talk today. The Article 6, Paragraph 2 says that the applicant is limited to Aboriginal groups or tribes. So they use another term here. But if you can understand Mandarin, they all the same. Identical says Bu Lu. So in Mandarin version says that Senqing Ren, Xian, Yuan Zhu Min Zhu, but in this act, they use Aboriginal groups or tribes. And Article 7 says that exclusive rights holders 
once the applicant is confirmed to be the owner, and then he owns the exclusive rights. And if an intellectual creation is confirmed to belong to the applicant and other specific original group of tribe, and they share this, this rights, could be the co-exclusive rights holders. And the third version is that if an intellectual creation cannot be confirmed to belong to any specific Aboriginal group or tribe, and the exclusive rights holder is under the entire indigenous, indigenous peoples. Okay, so by examining this legislation, we can certain say that this right is a private right, it's not a public law, right? But the rights holder are the same as Bulo. So if the Article 2-1 says that Bulo could be a public juristic person, and then can it or is that appropriate for a public juristic person to be a private exclusive rights holder? Is that appropriate? It, it, it could be, because legally, legally speaking, a public juristic person can hold a private right. But is that appropriate? Okay. But still, the question arises. How can we identify what is Hu Lo? So under this legislation, we can see Hu Lo refers to tribal community and Yuan Zhu Min Zhu used in this legislation. But it thinks legislation, how say, this legislation left out a number of different indigenous social organization inside the community, like the subgroups, clan, family, lineage, and other any other cultural groups like hunting group, ceremonial groups. Those are specific social organizations running inside the tribal community. And they actually let's take example because under this legislation saying that ceremony could be an intellectual creation exclusively owned by the applicant, which means a bulo. Bulo is bigger than ceremonial group. So is that appropriate we assign this right to Bulo rather than the ceremonial groups? That's one example. Also, the hunting practices. In tribal community, only specific person can be a hunting group. But once the hunting practices being recognized as an intellectual creation, then it can be only identified to be Bulo as the exclusive holder. So is that appropriate? So the core issue here from all what I explained to you. The idea is indigenous peoples and also tribal community. In my language, we call Alang, Alang, Alang. So tribal community, Alang, is the center of indigenous lives and cultures. Also, it is the traditional governance unit. And it's actually just the definition stipulated in Article 2 of the best law I just showed you. So our definition is okay, but it doesn't go fit or go straight with all other articles. And also, none of the existing and implement, implementing laws and regulations has clear definition which applicable to tribal community. Even we have Article 2-1, just like I show you, nothing says about the content and scope, and even the structure of the subject. So research question of this presentation is, how to position and construct indigenous subjectivity laws and its formation would soon be an important legal issue. 
And the nature and content of indigenous subjectivity laws need to be clarified. This is a very broad question. So the argument, one of the arguments is that whether the existing laws on judicial subject can embrace tribal subjectivity or a new subjectivity law is needed. Cultural conceptualization of traditional tribal governance in conformity with constitutional entrenched value of cultural diversity. So, I think we need a new indigenous subjectivity, which can echo to the constitutional value of cultural diversity or multiculturalism. Because one of these things I later on will be do a comparative study will be on the New Zealand Maoris. Because the New Zealand Maori, their social organization is from the Iwi, Hapu, and Hui. So that is two, three different organizations is running by their uh, running by their own uh, traditional practices and other regulations. So let's take an example here. This is the Atolan Amis age group. How they naming these structures. Maybe you, you might not get the whole idea. I just want to tell you, they divided their tribal organization through the age system. So under age 37 to 41, it's called Gaba, youth. Another way to say it is the labor of the tribal communities. So all the labor work is their main job, their main responsibility. And for the age 62 to 66 under is this, the people to do the decision making. And uh, for the elders, for the elders, upper level, they are the thinkers. Yeah. So they use this age group to develop, structure their social community, to run their daily affairs, public affairs. And the youngest, Bagalongai, they do whatever elders tell him to do. Okay? They do whatever the, the elders, yeah. So this is the, if you go to Tulan Bulo, yeah, you will see this. Now, I mean, you, you are not going to see this, uh, this structure. <laughs> you will see, when, when you see the people or, or you join a public event, you can see someone doing some things, and then they are just belong to each different structures. Yeah. So this is the one I say we have to find a way to create our own juristic person, the organization, the structures. So the holistic, when, whenever we talk about indigenous peoples, especially the development of traditional norms, we have to capture the holistic view. And this holistic view from some, I think there are three aspects we have to emphasize. The indigenous cultural practices we have to focus on, they have a specific way of representations. And this representation has a close relationship with ecological interactions. And there are huge, very intimate social relations embeddedness in the one. So even one of the practices, let's say the hunting practices, ceremonial practices, just like the Kakitaan, I show you why the shaman has picked a specific area to build up those. Because that's the way they represent. That's the way they interact with the ecology. And that's the way they have they build up their social relations. So 
the holistic view of the indigenous law. We have to cover all these three. That's why the, I argue that the indigenous, whether it is public juristic person or the private juristic person, has to cover this all these three area. And the one I say the social relations embedded is in the traditional indigenous worldview system. The age group system is the example from the Amish people. And I take my people as an example to say, to explain to you what is the social relations embeddedness in our own indigenous worldview system. The central idea, the core we call is Gaia. That's anything. Gaia means anything. It means our culture. It means our Lord. It means whenever we say Gaia, it is a wheel of self-determination. So the Gaia covers three different aspects. The social aspect here, the social aspect, which con consists of our education, which means Galilean, our languages. So our language is passed through our languages from our elders and if we complete the social uh, if we complete the education which pass on to generation to generation and then within all this education content we build up our social organizations and then under the social organizations we are a group of Share. So our social value shows that we are a co-sharing community. And our in, on the other side, it says our interaction with the ecology is the spatial, spatial relationship. So we have to understand the landscape. We have to understand the uh, our uh, knowledge system. So if you know everything around you, and then you can build up your knowledge system based on your interaction with the ecology, with the environment. And then that brings us to the pri uh, property system is the is a co-management co of property system. Because I think everyone probably heard about uh, indigenous people is also uh, how to say it? very ecology or conservative about the natural resources uh, interactions. So which brings us the our worldview is equality even between the human and the environment and animals. And then the central part is once we finish our social and spatial, and then that brings us to be a static bala. And the static bala means that we can all back to our Hakka Utus to be back with our ancestors. So all these three complete, we are the static bala. And there is a social organization to run according to these structures. So, Different nations have different structures. So, like I said in the beginning, it is an ongoing project. You might not get the whole pictures, or we, you might not understand some of the my, my saying here. But uh, I want to con uh, conclude saying that uh, in Taiwan society, people are used to override indigenous rights by using Han Chinese concept. And even the indigenous people maybe forget or give up our traditional culture and regulations, customary laws. So if the concept and the role of the public juristic persons could call back the spirit of indigenous traditional culture with the tribe's own ability, the goal of the establishment of indigenous people's self-government would be success through the public juristic person or the juristic person. 
but I'm still trying to finish this by one idea. I want to construct the indigenous law without the idea of law. Okay. So this is, uh, I conclude my talk today and hope to have more uh, communication with you guys. Thank you. When we, when, when we are trying to deal with those customary law or indigenous law, one of the problems we have is, the, is to identify the, um, the sources of those law. So they, they have got very little, what we have discovered is they have got very little, little written record and they are filled with contradictions. Now the approach we take in Hong Kong is a very, is a very what we would call a common law approach. We don't deal with it unless there's a conflict. Mm -hmm. But what about in Taiwan? Has, has the government been encouraging each tribe, for instance, to, to produce a very comprehensive list of what they consider to be, um, to be their exclusive right or intellectual um, creation? Or have they, have they, have they been you know, taking it on a case-by-case on -case basis and, and deal with it only on a case-by-case -case basis? OK, so I think the, the, the core question is about the source of indigenous law in Taiwan. And uh, actually, uh, starting from 2013, January 1st, our court system started to set up the Indigenous Ad Hoc Tribunal. And we also developed a certain rules to allocation the cases, which should be uh, deal with by this tribunal. So we have this court, this tribunal, but the question arises, what kind of law they should apply to? So this also has been discussed. So in, in the early years of this tribunal, uh, they always call up the elders yeah, as the expertise or the what's that the witness to give the deposition uh, to to prove or to give their uh, to give their views for the judges to decide on, on the cases, but this cannot be this cannot be the common practice for civil law countries, especially in Taiwan. So actually. Uh, I myself, along with a, a number of different colleagues, we started to study the customary laws collected by the Japanese government during the Japanese occupation time. So we kind of do a modern version on the indigenous customary laws existing and practicing in the modern area, and it has been published. So right now, uh, a number of calls will take into consideration to deal with the indigenous issues right now. Yeah, but, but still, you can see even from the presentation I share with you, all this law still needs the actual content of the indigenous rights. Yeah, yeah. Has the government been trying to make headway into creating those uh, comprehensive lists, for instance, or is it just you, know, you guys still working? Okay, on? so actually there's the two different uh, two different views on this. Uh, from the how to say it, the traditional legal training academia, they say that since we are civil countries we need and we should to make the customary law into the statutory law. For the people like me, I say no. We should do the common law experiences. Yeah, build up case by cases. Yeah, because once, once, once a customary law becomes a statutory law, which means it will be froze once it's written into the statutory. And then we will not see what's gonna transform because the culture is not frozen into, it's not frozen in the certain times. 
Yeah, if the if this practice is is, is agreed and followed by this specific group, and they wish you respect its practices. Yeah. I, I agree with you entirely. So um, let's open this up to um, to the audiences here. Um, so do we have any questions or, no? or perhaps uh, any aspect of the indigenous, indigenous law? Or anything? How about the ladies sitting over there? Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned the two um, most famous um, case of of prostitution that refers like to my study in undergraduate and I was um, luckily I had an interview with someone from Valentine um, including the Kakigan uh, villagers they live in inside and give them um, their view about the patriation sorry the restitution um, views about the case and um, I was quite doubting with the law there because um, as you said it was taken as a case specific but um, I was questioning about the government. They decide to make a replica and keep the uh, keep the real um, column in the museum instead of giving the uh, keeping the replica inside the museum. And I was really, really um, eager and want to know how you, as an indigenous people, um, how you view in this way. Because as I know in the case, people they thinking like, yeah, I bring back the soul, and that is what I want for this. And that is the, the happy ending um, in this case, but is it true for you? I'm not a person to believe in fairy tales. So that is a fairy tale. Okay, that's my position. And also they build a replica for the community, bring back to the community, and they keep the original one inside the museum. Right? So like I said, they but it's only for my opinion. They have been forced to marry. It. That's my opinion. But some people might not think that way. Because if you respect or if you treasure its heritage worse, if you treasure it is a heritage, even the state says that it is a national treasure, then why not you build up the conservation? So think back to the community instead of still keeping in the museum if it is a national treasure, right? So that, that's my thinking about this case. I'm not sure what about yours. In my view in this case, I was also agree with you, strongly agree with you. <laughs> Even I studied museology, I thought like, because based on the ethic, even not law, just the ethic moral um, standard, museums supposed to stick with the truth instead of um, giving something untruth within the context. So this is, I, I totally agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, again, I'm learning a lot. Um, I was very interested in the, uh, this gets back to your um, comment actually about culture not being frozen um, in time, that the definition of uh, being indigenous in the Basic Law Article 2 was following traditional norms, right? That seems to be a very key line. Um, that implies that there, there does come a time when you will stop being indigenous. In other words, if if you have to do this to be indigenous, then the state is also saying if you don't do that, you're you're not indigenous anymore, right? It's a category that you can move sort of in and out of. So, um, and in terms of subjectivity, a few things that I have questions about. One, um, Presumably, uh, a basic following of traditional norms would include speaking the language, right? And my understanding is that large percentages of, the, of these populations, perhaps the majority, no longer follow that traditional norm, right? Um, 
how does that affect their eligibility for a subject, legal subjectivity? Um, another thing that didn't come, uh, this, that, that, that comes up in, in, in US, the, the, you know, the United States is extraordinarily tragic history on indigenous matters is the whole question of biology, you know. Um, I'm assuming from the last speaker that there's clearly a demographic crisis. If, if most of these communities are populated by elders and children, that means that pretty much everybody else, right, is, in the, is elsewhere. And I would assume many, many of them, um, if they get married and produce children, are not marrying people from their same tribal background, right? So then their children, right, are they eligible? To what extent does the state take into account, right, the whole sort of biology thing? Because the traditional norms is strictly a, it's not a dissent argument, it's a consent argument, right? Um, and uh, sort of that's where, that's what I'm interested in. Even the circle diagram of social organization, you seem to emphasize that language was a very fundamental part of not just a medium for expressing the worldview, but is the worldview to a certain extent, right? It's an organic part of it. Um, are you eligible for legal subjectivity as an indigenous person if uh, you don't speak the language and let's say you move to the city and you do not follow traditional norms and your children are uh, from somebody else? I mean, who's not from that background, all of this, uh, who's eligible for what? So that's kind of what I'm interested in. When does the state say you stop being indigenous and therefore you're not eligible for any version of public juristic person? Tough. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday you are brutal. <laughs> no, just kidding. So, yeah, of course. <laughs> I think that's the question. Uh, for indigenous people in Taiwan regularly have to face because who are indigenous peoples and every day uh, the people are come uh, people are discussing that uh, a lot of uh, benefits the social benefit attached if you are indigenous peoples and then uh, to what uh, standard to what requirement you can maintain this status but first of all, I would like to say that I would like to say is indigenous people is a political term. It's never be a cultural term, for my view. Because every everyone here might belong to specific cultural group. So everyone can define by culture. But not everyone can define in Politically, politically. So the reason I say that is because if we look back to the history, why we have indigenous peoples is because the colonialism. It's because the arts come, other people come to indigenous land, occupy, dispossess, and take out all of their rights. And then starting from that point, we started to negotiate different status. But over time, the status changes, situation changes, the everything changes. So we have to reconsider who are indigenous people, or we can still be very clear on the requirement of indigenous peoples, but we have to consider what kind of the content should attach to indigenous peoples. That's why in Taiwan right now, language ability is a very important requirement. But that does not affect whether or not you are indigenous peoples. Yeah. So, which means within our own communities, we have to make clear indigenous community relationship with the state we only have to very clear on this line whether you are indigenous people or not and then if you are indigenous people and then you 
uh, in this group. And within this group, we are a self-government body, and then we run by our own, ideally. And that's the way we are, we, we are advancing right now. But if anything related to states, and then the states can put up, can add up requirements, like the language ability, like other things, that's the, when we deal with the states. So under the public jurisdiction, if you want to be a part of this group, and then the first thing we only, we all, we only have to care about is if you are eligible to be the member of this group, and then the rest just follow this area. But if you choose not to be the group, and then you are on the state side. Yeah. So this, I, I think, right now in Taiwan, we also follow the like biological, not a test. I mean the biological uh, blood quantum. Actually, in Taiwan, this blood quantum is 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 I can say is the most most what is that restricted requirement to maintain you are indigenous peoples. Yeah, I think it's the, the, the hardest way to become indigenous people around the world. Because even the, in the state, you can, you can only have six, uh, 164 or, or 132, you are still an Indian. Yeah, in, in, some, in, in some Indian nations. But in Taiwan, it, 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 it is very easy for you to lose the, the status as indigenous peoples. So, it is a controversial issue. The eligibility, because we always have, to have we always has to be challenging. Especially, uh, we have more than fifty percent of population living in the urban area, and most of them, the young people, are born and grow up in the cities. They know nothing about their people. Frankly speaking, they know nothing about it, but they enjoy the most of it the most of it. So it is a controversial issue. That's why we are starting to con uh, considering to add a certain uh, obligations for the people if you want to maintain your status. Yeah, I think that, that's one way of thinking. But for the, for the self-government issues, I think, for my opinion, once we set up our juristic person, we are in some way separated from the state. So the only thing we have to consider is whether or not you are eligible to be the member of the community, and then the rest of will be followed by the communities. Yeah. So it is not about um, whether or not you fulfill the outsiders' uh, expectations. Yeah, maybe I can say that. Hi, thanks for another uh, wonderful and informative talk. My question is about um, research ethics and getting uh, consent uh, for research, because we're all doing research projects for uh, a volume. Um, for Shunyi, do we all have to get um, permission from uh, any informants, indigenous informants, or um, from uh, the villages, the, the village communities to which they belong? Because in my research on Saigabale, um, the translation of the feature film uh, Saigabale, Bale, there were five translators, so I can get permission for them, but uh, this involves uh, also, the, the village communities to which they belong. So that's fifteen uh, of five five different uh, village communities. So I'm I'm just wondering um, what the logistics of this will be. Uh, do they sign something? Sign a, a release? The individuals will sign a release, but then they can't they can't give their consent as individuals because we also need the consent of the of the village communities. So I'm just wondering, has this ever kind of come up? Have cases come up 
where researchers have done research and then been challenged for not getting the, uh, the required consent, not just from the individual people that they're interviewing, but also from the, from the village communities. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think I will start with the, this article, the Human Subject Research Act, which means it is mainly focused on the human subject research not really to social sciences, that's the first thing. So social science research is not regulated by the Human Subject Research Act. Okay. But the basic law only says academic research, right? So even you are not covered by the Human Subject Research Act, you are still under the basic law, Article 21. Okay? So, so the second thing is, the law is not that effective unless there could be a suit, lawsuit. Has been any? No. But the reason for that is, if you are an independent researcher, you are not regulated by anyone. I mean, if that's your interest, yeah. uh, you can just go to a tribal community, you can go to anywhere to do your research. No one can, no one can force you to, to do anything or not to do anything, unless the interviewee refuses you, or they form a group to expel you out, right? That's the private individual actions. So the law only applicable for the public fundings. So right now in Taiwan, the Ministry of MOST, if the scholar wants to apply for funding, as that is related to indigenous peoples, if you want to get funding, you need to get approval. Yeah, I, I actually did this at NTU, and my experience was uh, 500 American. Yeah. 500 American dollars and a very complicated process. <laughs> Just so I could get permission, which I had already gotten from, from five individuals. So, I mean, at the time I, I found this very irritating. But then I, I also see the need for, uh, for it because, I mean, I'm, I'm doing this research, like for, for me certainly, for my academic career, but also it should be for the, the people that are helping me with the research and for their community. So I see the point. Yeah, I agree with you. But the point is, yeah. once we have our jurist, juristic person in place, yeah. those so-called, what is that? The Committee to Review the Ethic, e yeah. IRB. I, I, IRB. IRB. Once we have our juristic person in place, the IRB will be replaced. Yeah, but only for indigenous consent. But you, if you have, still have to follow academia ethic, you still have to follow the IRB. Yeah. But right now, because we don't have our own tribal IRB in place, so they are doing this, the, the existing IRB. But eventually, we will have our own. Okay. Yeah. And the 500 is very... I got a good deal. Reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the, the, the Taiwan, if you want to get, if you want to use the public funding to do the indigenous research, then every public authority will re ask you to get the approval first. Otherwise, they won't grant the funding. Yeah. I have another question. Uh, sorry. I have some someone else can ask a question. Please. Okay, uh, my father had a friend uh, about 10 years ago who had printed uh, Raven. They live in Victoria, Canada, so Raven is a mythological figure for the Haida, people who live on Vancouver Island and uh, the, uh, the mainland uh, north of Vancouver. And so he's not a native Canadian, but he was printing t-shirts and mugs and other kind of merchandise with indigenous um, uh, symbolism. And I asked him, well, what is it, why are you doing this? He said, well, just to make some money. And I asked him, well, what does it mean? Can you explain Raven in their, in their belief system? He had no idea, he's not interested. 
And um, I, I think you mentioned last time this is covered by freedom of expression. You can't stop him from, from doing this, but it seems to me it's not, it's not expression. He's not trying to express himself. He doesn't care. He's not interested. So is there any legal way to, to stop, stop this from happening? Stop this kind of thing uh, from happening? You mean in Canada? In, in Taiwan. In Taiwan. Actually, we do have just like the Protection Act. But if you want to do, if you want to bring a lawsuit, then first you have to make this pattern or totem be recognized as a right. It's not a copyright. Yeah, because copyright has the certain requirements, and the indigenous intellectual creation are existed for hundred hundred years. If you follow the copyright standard, it will not be become a copyright. It will become a public domain that everyone can use it. That's why why we want to protect indigenous people's totems or patterns or symbols anything because people misappropriately to use it. Yeah. So in Taiwan right now we have already this legislation in place. Once we get recognized and to get the certificate as a legal right, and anyone want to use it, we can sue it. And under the legislation, you can be fined. Uh, the the most is like uh, twenty. Twenty thousand U.S. dollars. Yeah, it's not that huge though. So. Single use. Hmm? Just one, one use. No, no, it just depends on how much you use. Yeah, it depends on the cases. Yeah, it's not that you print one, you have to pay. No, 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 no. nothing like that. Yeah. Okay, I have two um, brief comments and two. Very simple questions. Um, the first comment relates to the, the uh, preceding question. Um, the Scots have invented many things. We invented the defeat of the Roman Empire, we, we invented the steam engine, we invented continuous electric current and algorithms without which there'd be no computers. We also invented anesthetics and television, more or less the same thing, in my opinion. But we also invented, of course, Scotch whiskey. Now, at the present time, Scotch whisky is protected by European Union law. Now, uh, you cannot sell a product anywhere in the world and label it Scotch whisky unless it was actually distilled in Scotland. Now, a great fear uh, we have at the moment in Scotland <coughs> is that if Brexit takes place, uh, I personally don't think it will, uh, it will be England. But if they, if they do manage to take us out against our will, there is great fear that um, you, you will get rogue uh, countries like the United States or, or, or India um, selling cheap spirits using the name Scotch. Now, at the same time, um, those of you who are uh, keep up on fashion will have noticed in the last few years in the Paris fashion shows that um, <laughs> they, they, yeah, no, it's, there's a point, um, and not just in Paris but elsewhere, there's been increased use of uh, indigenous uh, ethnic uh, designs in, in, in contemporary fashion. <clears throat> now, um, uh, a lot of this uh, I'm a little bit unhappy about. I'm not against the interaction of, of different cultures. I'm very much in favour of it. Culture is a living thing, after all. <clears throat> but um, it should be done with respect, and that respect um, includes uh, economic uh, respect and recognition of, of the origins of, of, of a piece of creative uh, art. And, and, and the other comment is on language. Um, I personally think language is very important in culture. It underpins all forms of culture, including visual culture, because we read um, uh, an image differently depending on, upon which language we, we, are, we are thinking in for a start. Um, <clears throat> Um, now, um, of course, uh, uh, many languages, um, many peoples, um, under uh, all, all the kinds of pressures they, they, they have to endure, do lose, um, a, great, a large percentage of the population lose that language. 
um, and, and this has happened with, with the Sami, and um, uh, <clears throat> many Sami are aware of the loss, and they try to Samicize their lives in many ways, but they continue to express their lives in Norwegian, Swedish, Finnish, Russian. Um, yeah, for me, that, that's not enough. Okay. Um, but my question is this: two questions. Gaia, is this a word um, that exists in all the indigenous languages in, in Taiwan, or is it a word that comes from one language and then spread to the others? Um, and um, and um, I noticed in the, in the, in the, when you showed the table of um, ages, most of the age sections were four year differences and the next largest was five year differences. Is there a reason for that? Those two questions. So the first one is Gaia is my own languages. It's a static peoples. From my peoples. Gaia. Yeah, but, but, but is it a word that belongs to all the indigenous? No, languages? it's just it's just used by our people. Yeah, just used by our people. But this kind of idea has different words or terms in other indigenous peoples. Yeah, so different languages. And the four years or five years, uh, the age group difference is, I think, uh, I'm not an expert on Amish people, but it's based on the, how to say? No, not, not like expectancy. I'll say Mandarin. Okay. Oh, so is it is is on the um, men, psychological, mental, and you know, uh, mental capacity yeah. of those individuals? So it's nothing to do with counting systems. Counting. Counting systems. I'm sorry. What, what do you mean by counting systems? Well, um, some languages count in in, in oh. five. Some oh, count no, in no, 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 no. Nothing to do with that. legal background must be quite boring. It's fascinating <laughs> and, and, and actually it's not really about law, is it? It's more or less for me, it's about philosophical issues. For me it's more about cultural issues because coming from a law background you sort of lay it barer than, than people like us from humanity backgrounds who <laughs> dress up certain issues then try to make it sound, uh, you know. Anyway, it's fantastic. So can I ask you, um, because some question is being asked by, by, by Adam, uh, so I can't compete with that. So I can ask basic questions. For example, uh, because you are involving in policy makings and now you are actually in the center of the future indigenous uh, policy making, Process. So, could you tell us, as a, as a, you know, practitioner as well as a, a theorist, what can you offer, coming from your, uh, uh, from an academic background and doing something for your own people? What's your aim and what's your goal to to make up this new law for yourself? Another question is, if I may. Um, Adam did ask about the, a fundamental question, who are indigenous people? But I'm asking you again, because of your legal background, could you give us your take, uh, and also legally possible, uh, how are you going to frame this category and make it possible and workable for future uh, policy making? Thank you. I'll start with the second one. So, to define indigenous people, like I said, I always think it came from politics. Right? It came from the, what I said yesterday, I say colonialism, imperialism, and cultural imperialism. Right? But we are not in 
that period. So in Taiwan, a lot of people don't understand. And even if, if anyone wants to explain what happened in the past for the indigenous people, they will confuse them even worse. Because they, they don't care. People don't care. And, yeah, I, I do think so. And... But this morning, Professor, we just said it becomes such a hot topic. Sorry, it's okay. About... About indigenous issues and studies. So... Yeah, the indigenous study is a hard issue, but not what indigenous people happened in the past. What happened to us is not an issue. Okay? So that's why I think uh, I'll borrow yesterday's presentation more in the end. Most populations in Taiwan see indigenous people as just disadvantaged groups. They just see this aspect because they only see the present time. But they don't and they won't understand unless we have a big picture to let them understand the present situation has a lot of has a lot to do with what happened in the past. But we have to find a way, a very simple way to make them understand. Otherwise that will confuse them. Just like even right now in under the presidential office, we have this committee. One of our main tasks is to communicate with the public, saying that why we want to build up this community and what this committee, and why the president want to deliver this national policy. We still spending time doing this basic work. Unless this has been understood, we cannot move forward. Yeah. So it's the Han people need education, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So to define indigenous people, I think the historical injustice is the first thing we have to emphasize. But we also have to come to the present time. If we agree and if we support the idea or the constitutional value of multiculturalism, and then the first, the first thing we have to do is to revitalize the indigenous culture. So indigenous people, I think if we define or we, if we want to make people understand, for me, I will take these two approach. The historical injustice, which result in the present situation, and then in a positive way, if we support constitutional value, and then first we have to revitalize indigenous cultures. To revitalize indigenous culture doesn't mean that other culture is not important. Yeah. So I think I'm not sure whether is this enough. Thank you. And the first one is how can I do? I think I have done enough. <laughs> you know. But is this but my, my personal story, I mean, not a story, I'm still young. This is my tenth year when I graduated, uh, when I got my PhD, go back to Taiwan. This is my tenth year teaching. In the past, uh, yeah, it, this is 11. For the past years, I have, I have transferred four different institutions. So every institutions so far I only stay for three years. Wow. That's <laughs> so people always say they, they can't find a job. I but every three years I change a job. Wow. Yeah, so I started from Taitung and Hualien and to Taipei and now back to Hualien. Yeah. 
But I think there are still a lot for, for me to do, just like you say. I am lucky right now in the, you might say, in the center of the policy making. Yeah. So my way is that I think if I always say, as it is, it's, it's a common saying, if you want to defeat your enemy, you have to understand your enemy. And you want to defeat your enemy, just use his regulation and rules, and you can defeat it. Don't, so my way is I use, I first, I will use the state law. And then to some extent, to some point, then I use the indigenous law. Because I use the state law to as my the fundamentals. And those fundamentals solid, and then I use the indigenous law. Yeah. So you, for me, I think I will not complete what I want to do by disregarding the state's law. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. But we have to start from the state's law and then use the indigenous law and find a way to incorporate. Yeah. So the a lot of the this legislation thinking we have a group of peoples. So we don't use the the new term. We use the original term but without the actual content. So the actual content is the later on we will put into it. I think um, there, there's an interesting point to be raised about um, you know how to define the indigenous people, and I think you, you are absolutely correct. It's a political construct. And you were saying just a moment ago that you were using state law to try to um, defend your client or to deal with cases before you appeal to um, to the indigenous law. But um, what, what I mean, what would happen if there's an inconsistency between the state law? Um, as opposed to indigenous law, how has the court been? Has the court been very sympathetic when they're dealing with those issues, or have they been very adamant in applying the state, the, the, it, very very adamant that the state law should have precedence over the um, indigenous law? Mm -hmm. What has the situation been like? Because um, I would imagine some of those indigenous customs or regulations might be deemed inconsistent with your constitution in, in some sense. So how has the court been dealing with this? And what has the public mood been? Has the public mood been very, you know, very pro-indigenous law? Has they been, you know, saying, you know, hold on, why are these people getting all the rights? So how has the, you know, how has the public mood been like in Taiwan as well? So I think specifically, specifically, if we deal with these legal issues, and focus on the individual, then the state's law always trumps the indigenous law. So what we were doing and what we have been doing is we always make it collective. Make the issue, even if it's an individual issue, we make it like a, it's a whole people's issue, whole nations, whole communities. Because every time if you just make it like an individual and then individual right is protected under constitution. You have nothing to say about it. But the thing is, we make it like it is a collective issues under indigenous rights. And then we start from the collective, collect collectivities. And that way when we talk about, and actually we are still going to the individual discussion, but once you level up to indigenous nations and then the indigenous law will come in. Yeah. So like the divorce issues or no marriage issues. How there there have been a lot of cases about uh, the how to say the legality of the marriage. So both sides on one side, they, want, they, they don't recognize the legality of the marriage, but on the other side, say we are, we are already married. But on the other side, the African defendant, yeah, 
The defendant always say, we are already married based on our customary rituals, customary laws. But on the other, at the... The respondent, sorry. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> respondent. And a parent? Applicant. Uh, applicant, yeah. And applicant will say, under the state's law, we are not married. And then go to the court. And then you cannot say it is an individual issue. We have to say this is a static people's marriage, so we are not follow state law. And then it, we 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 level up to state. We level up to it is a static nation. And then the judge will call up the elders. Is this your customs? And we there are a number of cases based on the customary rules. Yeah, to to make the decisions. Yeah. Sorry, uh, just a very quick question about we just talking about the create creative art of of the from the village. So I just checked the website like from 2015 till now is only 11 pieces on the list. Mm. So it's so that like it's already three years, but only three uh, 11 pieces. So and most of them are songs, not really the graphic design. Yeah. Uh, what, one thing I know about like uh, creative work, some of them are judged not by Department of Culture, it's judged by Department of Technology, by Kirti Bu, not by, not by Wen Hua Bu. It's, it's a, a, a big discussion between, because it used to be some uh, concept of copyright used to be from manufacturing, like some cell phone design, so, so it used to be judged by Department of Technology, not Department of Culture. So, like these kinds of uh, creative work from trade, are they judged also by Department of Technology or judged by other someone? <laughs> yeah, because it will bring some misunderstanding to, to make a decision. Is it worth to be a creative art of this village? Okay, first thing, I, the, no offensive, the correct term is intellectual creations. And the full term is indigenous intellectual creations. And the authority is not culture or technology, it is council of indigenous peoples. So it is a parallel system to the intellectual property. Yeah. So it is not a creative works. It is a work existed for hundred hundred years. That's why this work cannot be protected under the IPR because IPR is the new one, right? Even your copyright or patent or trademark. They are all new, right? But under the indigenous intellectual creation, they are the cultural expressions existed already for 100, 100 years. The reason why we have this law, just like I said before, because a lot of people misappropriate use indigenous cultural expressions in an inappropriate way. So we are not protected for its, for its economic values. We are protected for its cultural values, first thing. And the second thing is, you are right, it's only 11 objects has been recognized. And even worse, this legislation has been in place since 2007. So it's already more than a decade, only 11. And the reason why there's only such less one of the reasons I must blank the academia. <laughs> and the other thing is, I must also blame the government because they don't want to take the res responsibility. They drag the academia people, you be the examiner. I don't want to make decisions. I call up a lot of scholars. 
please take a look whether or not it is fulfilled this cultural expression for specific in indigenous peoples. This is very, very funny. Right? I used to participate in some of the, the meetings. There's one time we are discussing a specific uh, music. It's not music. How to say it? Gu diao. Yeah, melody, ancient melodies. We are discussing whether it is a specific indigenous melodies. And then there's one scholar from the music background says that the African, she asked a question, can you put your melody in a wu xian pu? How to say, I don't know. Yeah, musical rotation. If you can't, and then this is not melody. Because under the academia standard, you have to put on those. Is that reasonable? And that's really the case. That is really the case. Yeah. And another thing is, even you are the totem patterns and they call out the scholar who has studied for his life, her life on indigenous patterns. And she, she or he sits there, and the indigenous people present their patterns, and they examine, they saying that, oh, this is not the original one. Because based on other scholars' book, it's different. Yeah. So you have to find, so it is very funny. Our own people, they present our own patterns, which is different from past research book and then you are not recognized. Yeah, so this is the kind of situation right now under this legislation. That's why we only have such less object has been recognized. Yeah, so we are still finding a way to let these scholars out. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. So if the community agree to the distribution of powers or distribution of authority, and then I think it is a, there's some kind of a, is it democracy? I don't know. Yeah, but I, I mean, the social organization is followed by, the, by its members if the distribution of powers are all agreed upon. Yeah. And the indigenous right actually, in a lot of ways, is in conflict with human rights, especially in the issue of gender. Yeah. In in a human rights standard. Yeah. But what is a universal standard? Yeah. Because the, even the democracy, the the United States always use the democracy to to what? To beat others. Use the idea of democracy. Yeah. So I mean, but it it, it is truly a another issues we have to face for the indigenous right and at least for the gender issues. Also in Taiwan. Yeah. Okay. So right. Well I would say on this very important note I'm going to um, thank Dr. Um Howie Marina again for this very informative talk and, and some very frank and um, very good answers as well to, to be fair. So um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.